Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the Waterloo Global Science Initiative. My name is John Matlock, and I'm just providing a few housekeeping notes before we begin this morning's agenda. So welcome to everybody in theater here in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, and welcome to everybody tuning in online. Uh, for those of you in theater, this would be an excellent time to turn off your personal cell phone devices so that we're not interrupted. The program will run approximately 90 minutes, uh, and I'd like to make a special welcome to a few of the uh, WGSI dignitaries who are in the room. First of all, our Vice Chair of the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, Faridun Hamdulapar, President of the University of Waterloo, uh, Chair of the Advisory Committee, Dr. Calvin Stiller, Board Members Tom Burstovsky, Art Arthur Carty, and Michael Duchenne are also here, so welcome, gentlemen. And with that said, we will uh, begin this morning's program with our moderator, Wilson De Silva. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, John. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first plenary of the Equinox Summit Energy 2030. Uh, my name is Wilson De Silva, and I'm the editor-in-chief and co-founder of Cosmos Science Magazine in Australia. Uh, I'll be serving as your host and moderator today's summit plenary session. In the first four rows of this theatre, uh, you will see there are 40 people who are the scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs and future leaders who are working in the summit to create a joint vision on transformative technological solutions that we will need over the next 20 years and beyond if we are to begin to realise a cleaner, more sustainable energy future. Every morning we will begin with a public plenary session like this one, in which four summit participants will propose innovative technologies and approaches or discuss systems issues with the potential to transform our energy system. Each of them will deliver a 10-minute presentation arguing their case or proposing solutions. Uh, today's session is plugging the planet, building capacity for the future. Following the presentations, we will explore the ideas further in a panel discussion and followed then by audience Q&A. But first, let me introduce you to our summit participants. Uh, they are Jay Apt. He's the professor of technology, uh, professor of technology at the Tepper School of Business and Engineering and Public Policy. And he's also executive director of the Carnegie Mellon Electricity Industry Center at the Carnegie Mellon University. He has had an impressive career that includes orbiting the Earth 562 times and two spacewalks when he was a shuttle astronaut. Yasin Kandi is a project leader at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, home of the Large Hadron Collider, and a professor in the Department of Energy Science and at Sungunkyun University in South Korea. He worked closely with physics noblest Carlo Rubia on the revolutionary nuclear power systems, and he'll be talking about some of those ideas today. Craig Dunn is the Chief Operating Officer of Canada's Borealis Geopower. And while he hasn't orbited the Earth, he'd like to drill deep into it. He's telling us why he's excited about Big G geothermal. Greg Naterer is the Canada Research Chair in Advanced Energy Systems and Associate Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. He's going to give us into an insight into hydrogen and improving energy efficiency amongst, amongst the whole range of other things. But before we start the talk, let's look at a short video uh, that looks one, at one element of capacity, and that is the generation of electricity. Let's have a look. When the first urban power plant was installed by Thomas Edison in New York City in 1882, it served only a small neighborhood and burned a modest amount of fuel. One plant, 58 houses. But as power stations and a delivery grid became a universal concept, the globe's energy requirements became colossal. We began with coal as fuel, moved on to oil, and added natural gas to the mix, all of which have contributed to our problem with CO2. Somewhat cleaner sources of energy were tapped throughout the 20th century with hydroelectric stations and nuclear plants. And while there is a movement toward clean energy generation from solar and wind, these sources are rolling out too slowly to close the gap between the world's energy supply and the growing demand. As it stands, almost all power generation in the next 20 years or more 
is going to involve fossil fuels, with coal having a massive resurgence. The world is currently struggling to generate 22 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity per year. Most of it is coming from high carbon fossil fuels. And by the year 2030, experts predict we will require another 40%. That's 30.8 trillion kilowatt hours per year to power the planet and meet demand. Most of that increase involves rising energy needs in the developing world. Clearly, we need to bridge that gap, and not by relying on high-carbon, non-renewable sources of energy. Creating efficient, clean, and sustainable forms of power production is critical. Is a scientific or transformational technological answer to this crucial global problem within our reach? Well, let's hear from uh, Jay Apt on the characteristics of wind and solar. Thanks very much. So I'm a teacher, so here's a quiz. What percentage of U.S. electric power is generated at the moment from renewable resources? Five percent. Okay. What you're forgetting is hydroelectric power. It's actually about ten and a half percent, and the vast majority of that is hydro. Uh, wind passed geothermal about five years ago, uh, but it's still considerably less than hydro. Hydroelectric power grew rapidly and then was stopped dead in its tracks in growth by land use issues. In the United States, uh, high head hydro was stopped in the mid-1970s, and increases have been driven by efficiency in the turbines. Let's look at wind. This is what wind looks like at about 2% of U.S. electric power, and you notice there's a bunch of Canadian uh, wind farms in there as well. I could imagine this map at 10 times that amount of power, at 20% or so. But the land use issues are not negligible. This is what good land use of wind farm looks like. That's a picture I took in southern Pennsylvania a little while ago. But here's another picture about 30 miles away uh, and that's not very good land use. That's uh, some developers thought if a little weed killer was good, a lot must be a lot better. Right? Land use issues for renewables are simply not something that one can sweep under the rug. This is uh, data from a paper that was published a year and a half ago. And the renewable resources are big land use effects. Uh, wind is slightly worse than solar photovoltaic, uh, about four times better than hydroelectric. Of course, you can use the wind uh, land for other things, growing crops, but you're not going to build condos there because there's a block of concrete about the size of this room uh, acting as a counterweight under each uh, wind turbine. Uh, biomass is already seriously competing with food for land use and has driven up the price of uh, uh, foodstuffs, as you know. So let me talk about some other characteristics of wind. This is what the load uh, in one of the big U.S. states, Texas, looks like as a function of hour. Now we heard yesterday uh, someone say that the load at night was really very low. It's not. The load at night is about two-thirds of what it is during the day. This is averaged over a year. And in no case is it less than about half of the peak during the day. There's a serious need for meeting the power at night. Wind is an almost perfect anti-correlation uh, with this load. This is wind in Texas. Again, this is 2009, averaged uh, every hour of, uh, of the day. Onshore wind blows more strongly at night, about half again as strong as it does during the day. We don't have enough data on offshore wind yet to know what the characteristics are. We hope that it may match load a little better than uh, onshore wind does. But the onshore wind has some other characteristics. It is fast uh, and, and very large changes in output, both positive and negative, up and down. This is hourly uh, output last year from all of uh, the wind turbines in Texas, 9,000 megawatts or so of uh, wind in Texas. And 
The interesting thing, when you look at this mathematically, is that it's not a normal Gaussian uh, bell-shaped curve distribution of these changes. It has what physicists call a fat tail. The chance of a, what's now known as a black swan event, is very high compared to what you would think if you looked at it as a normal distribution. And some of those events are calms. Others of them are, are greatly blowing wind. But here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, this is what the wind output looked like in January of a year and a half ago, uh, almost two years ago. A thousand wind turbines died completely for 11 days in January in all of uh, Bonneville's area. This is a black swan event. The chief technology officer of, uh, uh, of BPA tells me they never expected this. But this is the kind of thing that you get with fat tail uh, statistics. So we looked at this uh, kind of work at very high time resolution as well, and we can talk uh, in some of the later sessions about the detailed characteristics of what's going on in the frequency domain when you look at this, but one of the things that you can learn from that is that you can answer questions like, well, if we tied all of the wind farms, let's say in Texas, together, what smoothing do we get? Well, it turns out it really depends on the question you're asking. The smoothing at times like 12 hours is very different from the smoothing at times like seconds or minutes. And we can quantify that on the horizontal axis or the number of wind farms that we connect together and the vertical axis is the smoothing compared to a single wind farm. The colors represent a slice through the frequency spectrum at various times. 12 hours is in red and if you connect all the wind farms in Texas you get about a half the fluctuations at times like a half a day, but you knock out 95% of the fluctuations of an hour or better. So the kinds of things that you have to put in place to buffer wind differ greatly depending on what the time scale you're talking about. Now the fluctuations of 12 hours are immense compared to the fluctuations at an hour. So you need very large plants that ramp up and down quickly. And you have a very quick diminishing returns when you connect these things together. Connecting all of the wind farms in the country together doesn't do you much uh, good. In fact, we found that about a half a dozen wind farms together and you get to the point of diminishing returns. So now let me talk about a different type of variability. This is the graph you saw before about uh, Hydro, and you'll notice that hydroelectric power experiences about one large and one small drought every decade. This is U.S. data. Uh, so we asked the question, well, does wind do the same thing? We don't have enough wind data over you know, 50 years to do it, but we do have data from airports that are consistent automated data over the last 35 years or so, and so we put those data together in a model. And we think probably wind does have about half the kind of fluctuations, so you get windy years and calm years, about half the fluctuations year to year that hydropower does. So there will be, let's say, droughts, wind droughts uh, as well, we think. Again, we don't have quite enough data. So let me switch now to solar. These are current solar arrays uh, larger than 5 megawatts. And this is what was then the largest in the country in Arizona. And the left-hand graph is a nice bullet shape that shows the sun comes up, it generates power, it goes down. The very next day, which is the graph on the right, and this is one second data, uh, clouds have intervened. And the power is not steady. This is one minute data over a kind of normal day. This is 10 second data and again uh, solar power has fast and deep fluctuations. In fact when you look at the mathematics of it, solar power is actually uh, going to be more expensive to compensate for than wind power. And here it is over uh, two years of data and notice that uh, even in the sunny regions of the year uh, there are day-to-day -day very serious fluctuations. Okay. So now the last topic that I want to talk about is kind of a, uh, a plea for new technology, both battery technology and better technology for gas generation. Gas generation is what's being used to fill in wind power in much of the world. There's a little coal that's used. So we asked the question, what happens to the emissions from gas generators that are ramped up and down fast to follow these fluctuations? So we had a lot of data and we looked at the CO2 and the nitrous oxide emissions. Well, you know, if you put in 20% wind power, you expect 20% of uh, the pollutants to go away. We found that that's not actually the case. Uh, here, 
on the left we see CO2 and you get about three quarters of the benefit for installing wind turbines that you, why? Because the gas mileage essentially of these turbines is somewhat reduced. It's like my 16 year old learning to drive. She's on the gas, she's on the brake. Same thing with these things. On the right you see that the nitrous oxide emissions are actually a point solution for very uh, high power in these gas turbines. But we've shown these data to the manufacturers of the gas turbines and they're making improvements that ought to help this out. By which I want to say that we find in studying these renewable sources that we can get a jump on the kinds of issues that we'll see at truly large scales. And by doing that, we think that we can avoid some of the issues that would otherwise plague us at the moment. So thank you very much. Again, none of this means that wind or solar, if the costs ever come down, and there was a story in the paper uh, that uh, a very large solar farm in Israel, 400 megawatt farm, is coming in at uh, $6,060 a kilowatt all up. But if the costs ever come down, the, none of this means that they can't be used at large scale. It just requires a portfolio of fill-in power, and some of it has to have ramp rates that are fast, and some of it's slow, and good land use planning, which I think will be the limit for wind and possibly for solar, although not so much there, and R&D. So thank you. Thank you, Jay. There's plenty there to think about. <laughs> Next. Next we'll hear from Yasin Kandi, who's going to talk about um, a very different kind of nuclear. Yasin. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. So I would like to thank the organizers for this kind of invitation and giving me the first opportunity to visit uh, Canada for the first time. Thank you. So you may want to ask yourself why physicists at CERN are interested in uh, nuclear energy. I mean, it's true that uh, one of our main mission is to uh, do fundamental research, uh, look for the uh, origin of uh, matter, the Higgs particle. But uh, we believe we also have a responsibility in uh, promoting uh, scientific education, uh, technological development, and also uh, uh, contributing in finding solutions to the uh, problems that society is facing today. And one of the main problems, of course, is uh, energy. So. Uh, nuclear uh, energy is, uh, has a potential in order to satisfy the demand for uh, uh, a very long time and uh, is obviously also uh, appealing from the point of view of uh, uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse, gas, uh, uh, greenhouse gases. However, it has many concerns and uh, which are listed here. So accidents, safety, accumulation of radioactive uh, nuclear waste, nuclear proliferations, depletion of uranium resources. And uh, these problems will have to be solved before we consider extending further the use of nuclear power. So putting it uh, differently, I mean, the required conditions for nuclear to be sustainable uh, are the following. So uh, they will have to uh, uh, require uh, extremely high level of inherent uh, safety, and unfortunately, we had, again, uh, 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 saw the ex uh, um, an ex an, uh, experience of this uh, at Fukushima. Uh, it will have to minimize the production of long-lived nuclear waste in order to eliminate uh, the need for uh, deep geological repositories. It will, be, uh, it will have to be highly resistant to diversion, obviously. And uh, we will have to make more efficient use uh, uh, of the natural fuel. And uh, that goes also uh, for uh, isotopic uh, enrichment, so you are in 235 enrichment. Uh, finally, uh, we will have to lower the cost of the, uh, of the heat produced. I think that is uh, the main argument for having this uh, technology attractive to developing countries, so that we will have to provide a cheap form of, uh, uh, of uh, nuclear technology. And why not uh, increasing the operating temperatures in order to uh, open up the applications of nuclear uh, uh, fission uh, to other applications like uh, district heating or production of uh, hydrogen. I think this will be uh, basically raised uh, in the next, uh, by the next uh, speaker. So the question you may want to ask yourself, so why are these subcritical systems or subcritical reactors some, sometimes called nu green nuclear power? Or could nuclear fission be exploited in a way that is acceptable to society? So to answer these questions, Carlo Rubia, uh, which is the 
who is the physics uh, 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 Nobel laureate in 1984, and his team at CERN have carried out, uh, as early in the 90s, a series of uh, uh, experimental, uh, um, extensive experimental program, which has led to the conceptual design of a, a new type of nuclear fission uh, device, which is driven by a proton or particle accelerator, which uh, has, many uh, has many attractive features. Uh, it is worth mentioning, though, that uh, pioneering work in this field already took place as early in the 50s, in particular in Canada, in Chalk River. So Wilfred Bennett uh, Lewis uh, was uh, conducting or investigating this, time, uh, this type of systems for uh, uh, basically promoting, in, I think it was the Material Test Accelerator project, which was uh, trying to breed fissile materials out of uh, um, thorium-232 at that time. And uh, this was also uh, uh, finally, um, how do you say, uh, uh, also made in the US uh, with uh, Berkeley and Los Alamos for uh, some other purposes, uh, which I will not mention here. And uh, so these systems, basically what you have here is, uh, I don't know if you can see this correctly. So this is basically how the system would look like. So this is uh, the energy amplifier, as we called it. So this is an accelerator-driven system. So it is a subcritical system. So this is a very major feature of this kind of system. So as opposed to the reactors that we have today, which are running on the critic, which are critical. So basically, the chain reaction is uh, uh, maintained by keeping the criticality uh, equal to one. In these systems, the, the, the uh, in these systems, the subcritical level is below one. So these are subcritical systems. So they are driven by a proton accelerator, which means that as soon as you switch off the accelerator, basically your reactor will shut down in a very safe way. So this is a very important feature in the sense that. These kind of systems would avoid to have a reactor uh, a reactivity run, uh, run away like we had uh, 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 at Chernobyl. It is a fast neutron system as opposed to uh, uh, thermal neutron systems, which are basically uh, uh, feeding most of the reactors today. So, uh, and is using lead or lead alloy as a moderator or coolant. Uh, this has uh, two main advantages. Uh, lead or lead alloys uh, boils at very high temperatures, so almost 1,800 degrees or 1,900 degrees. And of course, this is, uh, gives you uh, much better safety margins as far as operating reactors with uh, uh, water, which boils uh, very at uh, very high, low temperatures, or even if you want to increase that, you would have to pressurize the systems, or even sodium, which boils at 800 degrees. So this is one of the very good features. So we have enough safety margins, basically, to protect for a loss of coolant or type of accidents, which uh, also occurred at Fukushima a couple of months ago. It is uh, operating using fast neutrons, and fast neutrons are very efficient for burning uh, nuclear waste, so burning the plutonium and the minor actinides which are produced. It is equipped with uh, passive safety features. This is due to the fact that we have a heavy liquid metal uh, cooling, so no possibility for a core meltdown. And finally, it is using uh, a thorium as a base fuel uh, rather than uranium. And this has a very nice uh, features as far as minimizing the nuclear waste and the proliferation aspects. So why can you really have a nuclear energy without uranium or plutonium? So basically what you have in this plot is a, 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 a table of elements, and uh, it's very hard without a pointer, so... No, it doesn't work. Okay. So basically in standard reactors, so we are uh, mostly uh, um, uh, using fuels which are made of uranium-238 and a little bit of uranium-235. The presence of uranium-235 is essential for the uh, um, critical chain. To, to happen, so it is providing the neutrons which will undergo fission and produce energy, while the rest of the neutrons will be captured by uranium-238 and form uranium-239, which will decay very rapidly to eventually plutonium-239. Plutonium-239 is also a fissile material, so it will undergo fission, but not with a very high probability, and will basically capture neutrons and Further, uh, go further down the chain and produce the higher actinides, which forms the, the long-lived nuclear waste, so the legacy. Uh, with thorium, it's a very similar behavior. So thorium will capture neutron, produce thorium-233, which will decay 
to uranium-233, which is highly fissile. So this is the isotope which will make fission happen, or which will uh, light up the, the, the thorium fuel. However, thorium has no, initially thorium has no fissile uh, uh, isotope, like, unlike uranium-235. So these type of reactors would need external source of neutrons to be able to start up. So this can be either uh, uh, nuclear waste, uh, weapon-grade plutonium, if you want to dispose of that, or uh, any other fissile material. So, these, so thorium fuel uh, uh, basically uh, uh, is viable. So the other advantage of thorium is that they're uh, relatively uh, uh, abundant on, uh, on the Earth crust. They're actually four to five times more abundant than uranium. Uh, the reason is simple. Uranium is very soluble in water, so most of our uranium has gone uh, into the ocean, while the thorium has remained on the Earth crust. And it's also very, uh, making use uh, very efficiently of the resources in the sense that uh, you would not have to enrich thorium, so thorium consumption will be matched to the actual uh, uh, resource production. So that is one of the main uh, uh, problems with the uranium, present uranium cycle, is that we have a lot of losses uh, when it comes to mining and the tailings and, the and in the enrichment process. Uh, it, will be, it is environmentally friendly in the, in the sense that it is producing uh, low -lived, uh, uh, very low long-lived uh, uh, radionuclides and also it's uh, uh, quite proliferation resistance in the sense that even the U233, so the fissile material which is produced, uranium-233, make it, makes it very difficult to build a nuclear bomb, a nuclear device with that, unlike uranium-235 or plutonium-239. So, finally, thorium-based fuels, so I think, fits the bill in, in, in that respect. Uh, the third question you might ask is, why hasn't thorium been used for as a nuclear fuel before? And uh, we see in this table that we already, back in the 60s, we already had quite a lot of uh, several programs actually uh, 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 using thorium or trying to use thorium uh, uh, in a thorium fuel cycle. These were mostly uh, uh, done in the US and in, uh, in Europe. And uh, uh, they were all basically, as you can see, uh, 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 finalized in, uh, in the 80s, terminated in the 80s. The main reason for that is that at that time it was thought that the thorium fuel cycle could not compete economically with the, uh, the well-known uranium cycle. Uh, lack of political support for the development of uh, such a technology, uh, especially after the Chernobyl uh, uh, accident, and uh, increased the worldwide concern regarding the proliferation risk. Uh, it is true that if you want to use the thorium fuel cycle, you will have to use it in the breeder uh, uh, form, which means that you will have to recycle, reprocess uh, uh, the spent fuel. And of course, that is one of the main concerns, especially in the US uh, at that time. So except for India, which is uh, heavily or uh, utilizes, considering utilizing thorium for its long-term energy security. The fourth question is, has anyone built subcritical reactors before? Well, if you look at, uh, this is a curve or a table which is showing you the time which uh, 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 takes to develop a nuclear technology. Uh, on the average, we are now operating systems in, uh, which are of the uh, generation two uh, types. I think they make up about 90% of the nuclear reactors uh, which are installed today. Generation three are being uh, uh, deployed and we're thinking about generation four in the next uh, uh, 20 to 30 years. So it takes about 20 to 25 years to deploy a generation. Uh, that is, and what you can see also is, most of these generations are just evolutions of the old uh, 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 designs. So with this kind of system, of course, it's a revolution in, the, in terms of the design. So it will take much longer time to deploy uh, uh, these systems. So that's why uh, no such uh, uh, system is deployed today. Uh, however, we did carry out uh, uh, quite a, a series of experiments, basically testing the fundamentals or validating the fundamentals of these systems. Uh, one of the experiments uh, was carried out at CERN back in 1994. This was the first energy uh, amplifier test where we irradiated uh, an assembly of natural uranium rods, so about 3.6 tons of uranium, with uh, uh, proton uh, uh, particles. And uh, what we find is that, and we measured basically the energy uh, output of this system, and we found that, the, uh, uh, that uh, this system could provide an energy gain up to a factor 30, so validating therefore the concept of energy amplification. This system was operated at the watt level. So. 
Uh, many worldwide programs have been uh, are taking place, so you can see the first two experiments, it all started at CERN, so with the FIT and the TARC experiment. TARC experiment was basically used to demonstrate the possibility of transmuting long-lived fission products. This was done uh, successfully at the milligram level. So we're quite far away from uh, uh, reality here. And then uh, a series of uh, experiments were done using uh, fusion uh, uh, neutron, external neutron fusion neutron sources. And uh, as you've seen uh, later, most of the uh, 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 programs which were proposing somehow the realization of a prototype at different energies, so moving from watts to kilowatts and uh, megawatt level, were either cancelled or uh, uh, postponed. And this is due to the fact that generation, most of the activity or design activity or R&D work in the nuclear field shifted from ADS towards generation four type of reactors. So there was a shift of interest basically in the countries, different countries conducting this type of research. There is still, however, on the study, the possibility of uh, building a prototype in Europe, in Belgium in particular, uh, with a 60 megawatt level. So question five, can they really burn all nuclear waste to generate electricity? So you can see from this curve, so basically the green curve is the radiotoxicity of the waste uh, uh, spent fuel, which is basically would eventually, if nothing is done, will go uh, uh, deep on the ground. Now with the uh, uh, transmutation, so you can achieve basically up to a factor uh, a thousand uh, or more in reduction of this radiotoxicity. But the most, uh, uh, the big advantage is that uh, uh, you uh, basically reduce the long-lived uh, activity of this waste by transmuting them. So coming, uh, shifting from a few million years down to uh, a, a thousand years. If you also combine this with the uh, transmutation of the fission products, so the second component of the nuclear waste, you can basically go down to a few hundred years. Now for this type of uh, uh, nuclear waste, you can think of secular repositories rather than deep geological repositories. Pyramids are still uh, 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 hanging around, so we know that uh, human, uh, humankind can engineer facilities which can last uh, a few thousand years. So we believe that basically with the, uh, uh, by reducing the half-life of these uh, long waste and building secular repositories, we can contain them for this uh, uh, period. Finally, question six, so can accelerator-driven system mean meet the 10 gigawatt implementation scale within the next 20 years? I think this is one of the main questions we were asked to answer uh, uh, in this summit. So basically, this is a layout of what uh, a 1,500 gigawatt uh, uh, system would look like, uh, basically producing, uh, consuming uh, up to uh, uh, about uh, three tons of uh, fresh thorium uh, yearly and transmuting about uh, a few uh, 400 to 500 kilograms of uh, um, uh, nuclear uh, long-lived waste uh, per year. So this is such a system could basically uh, handle the waste generated by about uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, current uh, pressurized water reactor. So this is a very good uh, uh, scale. Now, uh, how to deploy these, uh, uh, these systems? So there are several scenarios. Uh, in countries which already have an existing, a uh, strong existing nuclear park, of course, their main concern uh, would be to deploy these kind of systems basically in view of handling the nuclear waste. So that, uh, and uh, as you can see from this curve, so we're thinking of deploying these type of systems uh, uh, by 2050s and having, however, a demonstration phase as early as 2030. A demonstration phase means already demonstrating uh, 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 burning, transmuting waste to the kilograms or tens of kilograms uh, uh, level. For countries which do not have uh, already a, a large installed capacity, nuclear capacity, so then the advantage would be to already, uh, 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 by 2030, uh, uh, demonstrate the possibility of using efficiently the thorium fuel cycle. So really shifting from the present uranium plutonium to the thorium fuel cycle and demonstrate at the same time the possibility of transmuting efficiently nuclear waste in thorium. And that would be, uh, how do you say, launching the first stage of uh, accelerator during systems. And basically, uh, we saw that uh, the net result of this would be a breeding of uranium-233, this, uh, which is a fissile material, and uh, combining thorium and uranium-233 could launch the second generation of uh, uh, light water reactors basically operating on, on thorium instead of uh, uranium, and therefore minimizing the production of 
plutonium and minor actinides. This is basically a system that could apply very efficiently uh, to the case of India. India is, uh, as I said, uh, considering uh, thorium in the, in, uh, as a main uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, utilization of the thorium for sustainable uh, nuclear power program. But uh, uh, for achieving this, they will have to uh, uh, handle basically three types of nuclear fuel cycles. So uranium, uranium-plutonium fuel cycle, and eventually the thorium fuel cycle, but also three types of nuclear reactor technology. So pressurized heavy water uh, reactors, so can do like water reactors to uh, transform uranium to plutonium. Uh, this they've done at a very early stage in order to build up the fissile inventory for uh, civilian but also military applications, unfortunately. Can do are very good in producing plutonium. And then this plutonium would be burnt in the second stage in fast breeder reactors, so they are already uh, 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 constructing or almost under uh, uh, finalizing their first fast breeder reactor. And this would uh, basically, the plutonium would be burnt and uh, converted into uranium-233 uh, uh, with the thorium, with the help of a thorium blanket. This uranium-233 would then uh, be mixed with thorium and fed into their advanced pressurized heavy water reactor to start burning thorium. Uh, if you would consider accelerator driven at this stage, you will basically remove the first two stages. So that would be a huge economy in terms of deployment of the nuclear uh, 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 technology and also the fuel cycle technology. So in summary, can atomic power be green? Well, physics suggests it can. Uh, Accelerator-driven systems have uh, uh, additional safety margins, which give them uh, uh, operational flexibility for future systems. I think this is for safe and clean energy production and uh, also waste transmutation. This includes also uh, uh, transmuting uh, nuclear weapons. Nucle <coughs> Present accelerator technology offers the possibility for applying a closed thorium fuel cycle uh, as opposed to the open, uh, uh, open, uh, open one through cycle, which uh, uh, of course is the only way to uh, uh, consider uh, nuclear power in a sustainable uh, way. So uh, the next step is uh, a demo, when uh, and where. And we hope that by 2030 we would have a first demonstration of this technology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yassine. Well, it sounds like you hit two birds with one stone there. You burn old nuclear waste, then you generate power. It sounds fantastic. Next, we're going to hear from Craig Dunn, who's uh, getting his inspiration from deep inside the Earth. I want an energy superhero. I want an energy resource that makes me happy when I turn on the lights. I want to be able to start my truck light up my big screen, have long hot showers, and never feel guilty about any of it. I want to know that I'm leaving an energy legacy behind that my kids don't go, thanks, Dad. I want energy projects that people get excited about, that politicians want to cut ribbons for. I want people to have the same reaction to energy they do when astronauts land on the moon. I've been talking with some of you in this room, and I think you want that too. So what kind of energy inspires us? What makes us get excited about going to see a ribbon cutting for a brand new nuclear power plant or an incredibly new wind and solar technology? Well, the list is, is actually pretty short. It includes pretty much everything. First, it needs to be inexhaustible. Call it renewable, call it whatever you want. It just better never run out. No empty gauge whatsoever. I'm talking billions of years of heat, power, lighting. I should be able to do it all, and I want it to never run out. It should be clean. No spills, no water contamination, no forests decimated, no air pollution, no missing mountaintops, no cancer causing anything. Remember, this is a superhero of energy. We want it to have an environmental footprint so small, you don't even see it. We want to know that we never have to pay to clean it up. You know what? Even better, let's not have it make a mess in the first place. I want it all the time. This power source needs to be available to us anytime I want it. I never want to turn on my lights and have nothing happen. 
No shortages, no brownouts, no rolling blackouts, no intermittency. Power 24-7, 365. The middle of a Tuesday night or Stanley Cup final. These things better work. I need it to be local. I want to know where my energy is coming from. I don't want to watch the news and read about some, or hear about some crazy foreign dictator getting rich from my energy resource. I don't want to find out that my energy was shipped from some pristine remote forest. Wouldn't it be great if you knew that your energy resource came from down the street where your kids play, or that you actually met your local power developer at the grocery store? Oh, and one more, and this one's kind of important. I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> I want it to be reasonable. I know it's my power, I'm going to pay for it. But I want this price to be respectable. I don't want to be taken to the cleaners by my energy resource just because it's clean. Oh, and stable. I don't want it based on some crazy commodity price that I get one bill one month and twice the bill the next month and then half the bill the next after. I'm thinking 20, 30-year contracts. So who's with me? Who thinks that this power source is a pretty good one, right? This is the type of thing, you have projects like this, people talk about media coverage, everyone gets behind this sort of thing. It's the type of power or development projects that inspire people to get behind the energy sector. I would say one of the biggest things that we come across in, in our industry and most of us is that people just don't seem to care about energy. It's just not that big a deal. So we want something that people are actually going to go out of their way to say, this is a good idea, I can get behind this. So this is a nice, nice idea. It's a beautiful concept. But I think what's important here is that we actually think about what we want so that we know how to go get it. I've been looking for my energy resource since my time working as a geologist in the oil sands. <laughs> and I think I found it. I, I uncovered that geothermal energy is, is one of the energy resources we very seldom talk about. And why is that? I have yet to figure that out. <laughs> we have an incredible resource right beneath our feet. Our beautiful blue speck in space has all the energy we will ever need in the form of heat. It's geothermal. It means Earth heat. But heat, for most of the people in the audience, is just a form of energy. And the top 1% of our planet has enough energy to power and heat civilization for approximately the next six billion years. Six billion years. So what's the source of this heat? Similar to some of the nuclear programs we've seen, it's a radioactive decay, potassium, thorium, uranium. It gives our planet about 70 or 80 percent of its uh, heat generation capability. Now, don't get nervous. It's okay. It's been doing this for about 4.5 billion years already and completely natural. Um, it's been used in many different applications. The one that most people think of is geoexchange. So the heating and cooling applications that are under you know, some innovative buildings, new housing. I actually work on the other side of this equation. I'm involved in geopower. This is converting the deep heat resources and steam production to produce electricity. If you don't think this is a, a new and innovative technology, we've been doing this in Italy since 1904. This is, by most definitions, would classify as a mature technology. Um, so how much heat are we talking about? Internal heat content of 10 to the 31 joules. This is a lot of heat resource. To put it in perspective, I brought an apple. Planet Earth. At our core, it would be about the same t temperature as the surface of the sun. So your apple seeds are about 6,000 degrees Celsius in this example. With a radius of 6,300 kilometers from the you know, skin right to my seeds, I have the deepest drill ever in Russia as actually about 12.3 kilometers thick. Incredible piece of science, incredible piece of drilling. It would not have cracked the skin. It only went about a third of the way into the continental crust. In terms of this, I like to think we don't have an energy shortage. We have an exorbitant amount of energy resource. It's the cheap and easy stuff that seems to be eluding us. So how does this work? How do you turn Earth's heat into actual power you can put online? 
Well, as uh, my CEO likes to put, very bright geologists and very, very bold financiers. <laughs> um, but the technical side of it, and in a 10 minute presentation you're getting the elevator version, you need to find a heat resource as close as you can to the surface. Now the heat is everywhere as we've talked about, but the hotter and the shallower you can drill for this resource, the more likely your project's going to be cost competitive. <coughs> Even better if you can locate the resource under a power line in a market that's going to pay you top dollar for your clean, renewable baseload power. You drill the production and injection wells um, after you've gotten the financing to do so, which again is probably one of the toughest things that we face in the geothermal industry, uh, at which point you're moving up your production well, so your beautiful earth has heated your water, you're moving up the production well into your power facility, in this example, the emission you see here is actually just water vapor. So we're in a position where uh, for flash steam turbine production, uh, it's water vapor. In binary systems, and we'll talk about that in a sec, it's a, there is actually almost no emissions associated. At this point, we've been able to produce the power, put it online, local market, and then be able to send the cooled water back into the injection uh, system, at which point it trickles through our formation and reheats. Looks pretty simple, right? Except my formations actually probably look like this, if not worse. The technical side of the geology is actually can be quite challenging. But at the end of the day, uh, with a bit of homework and the right financing, these programs can run technically forever. The idea is that if I design my program correctly, I can actually remove less heat than the Earth is providing. It's almost like having more inventory than I'll ever sell. The binary unit for the Canadian market is something that we're, as a Borealis Geopower, is likely going to be involving. And this, this is a good example. This turbine technology has advanced quite a bit in the last number of years. And what we're seeing is that they're being able to bring these temperatures down. With this type of system, we can actually develop power from temperature water below 80 degrees Celsius, 74 degrees in uh, China, Alaska at the moment. So let's see, how did, my, uh, how did my superhero as geothermal hold up? Inexhaustible. We're not talking about seven generations of heat. We're not talking about you know, a 30 or 40 year lifespan. Projects like the one in Italy have been running for 100 years, and we have billions of years of heat resource in our planet. So I think inexhaustible, I get a pass. Is it clean? Well, as I pointed out, the flash uh, systems have you know, low emissions. Uh, the binary turbine technology that we're hoping to implement in the Canadian market would actually have no emissions. Uh, the water is recycled in the system, so it works more like a backpack than the actual source itself. And the environmental footprint is so small because we bury most of our infrastructure. So you actually don't get to see too much at a binary turbine power plant. So am I clean? Yes. I have no waste product. I think I'm doing pretty well on the clean side. 24-7, 365. Now this is sort of our bragging point as a, as a resource is that renewable energy takes a, um, usually a, a couple cheap shots for its intermittency. Geothermal is one of the few renewable resources that actually puts power out consistently at a 90% uh, baseload capacity. So 90% of the time these things are, are producing the power that they are capable of producing for existing facilities in the worldwide today. This puts us at the very top end of power when you want it. Local. I have to say this might be the kryptonite in my, uh, in my renewable energy resource because one of the issues we have is that we're too local. In many cases, uh, I can't ship my resource as an energy supply. So electricity is very much a perishable good. The further I have to ship it, the less likely I'm going to get the price point I want for it. it as a geologist, it's so much easier to, sh to drill for commodities because I can put them in a bucket and put them in a you know, in a tank, and I can ship them where I get the best price. This isn't a reality for geothermal. So in many cases, in Ontario might be a good example, that power price might be just too expensive. But in areas like BC, uh, Idaho, Utah, these are all areas that the development of geothermal has taken a little bit longer to move forward, but they have the potential resource to be an incredible power f opportunity. This one might, uh, might surprise some people. Real levelized cost for geothermal electricity, actually about four and a half to seven cents a kilowatt hour. 
Who's, who's surprised by that? Yeah, we're uh, sneaking in the back door, a little bit of a dark horse. The problem is, is that you put all your money up front. So this is, in many cases, by the financier community, considered a high-risk event. But the, the advantage is, is by doing that, we actually create an environment where we've taken all the risk, and then it slowly plays out to be quite a safe choice and quite a cost-effective choice. You just have to have the financiers that are willing to take the initial risk to develop. A couple of good examples of places where sort of we've, we've tapped the lowest hanging fruit. In California, geothermal, as we heard earlier, actually produces almost 5% of their, uh, their power supply. And they're running pricing in that area from about 3 to 3.5 three cents a kilowatt hour. In Iceland, geothermal energy costs less than 2 cents a kilowatt hour. And it gives them about 50% of their power for the island. Uh, so am I cheap? Am I stable? Yep, long-term pricing is actually to the advantage of a geothermal developer, so I'm giving you long, cheap, stable pricing. If you're skeptical, let's just look at the rest of what the rest of the world's doing with this. Approximately 3,100 megawatts in the U.S. market. Iceland, I've mentioned. Uh, there's a number of projects developing in Latin America, Germany, New Zealand, Japan. And in all, there's over 10,000 megawatts online capacity right now in 24 different countries and supplying 60 million people with baseload renewable clean power. Now my pitch is geothermal, it's the field I work in, but I think it's really important that any energy resource that can fulfill these points will be classified as an energy superhero. If you can be renewable, clean, baseload, if you can give us inexpensive and stable power, this is something that will inspire and this will invite people to get involved in the energy sector, to be supportive and to actually motivate the type of change that is really, really necessary for our planet right now. I'm passionate about this because I want to give the next generation an energy legacy to be proud of. In my mind, that includes geothermal. So for me, my superhero energy choice is geothermal. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. It sounds fantastic. It's uh, deep mining meets big energy. Um, and only one apple was sacrificed to show you that. Um, now we're going to look at, uh, we're going to listen to Greg Naterer, who's going to give us his vision on the role that hydrogen might play. Good morning, everyone. So we just heard about one form of energy superhero, and I'd like to talk about another one, which I think also can qualify, and that is hydrogen. You might be wondering about hydrogen, is hydrogen for us, or is it for our grandkids? That's one of the topics I'd like to hopefully answer <clears throat> with, this, with this presentation this morning. First thing I'd like to say, is hydrogen is a potentially major solution to the problems of climate change and depleting conventional fuels, and that's what I will be uh, covering. Now, just, um, just like to make a few points about climate change and, and just ask a question is if we can fathom as to how fast climate change really is happening. And this is a graph that shows uh, the Greenland satellite melt record for ice. And the, the answer is climate change is happening very quickly. Uh, 90 cubic kilometers of ice melting per year in the, uh, the, the early 90s. And that has uh, risen exponentially since that time. It's uh, getting close to uh, 300 cubic kilometers of ice at this time. So the answer is very quickly. How, how does that actually look in terms of uh, what it would be in one year? This is, this is a section of Greenland. That's a lot of ice that is melted in one year. The, the average around the world, by the way, is not, not this high. It's around three to four feet, but nevertheless, it is, it is going quickly. How would that look if Florida's coast... Uh, how would Florida's coast look if Greenland or the West Antarctic ice sheet melted? Um, this is a distinct probability. Uh, by the end of the century, if it's status quo with CO2 emissions rising at the rate that they're going, and uh, 
You know, I was just at a conference recently in Miami, and I was astounded by the number of skyscrapers that were being built right on ocean level. So obviously,、uh, there's a lot of people that are still not taking the whole issue seriously in terms of climate change. I think this is sort of a bleak picture. Let's now talk about something more positive. What is the good news? One of the pieces I think of the future energy mix that does have very bright potential is hydrogen. If there was only one reason for hydrogen, I would be a skeptic and make no.、Uh, I, I don't hesitate to say that there are skeptics out there about hydrogen and its potential, but I'd like to put forward the case that there are at least eight, if not many more, reasons why hydrogen is a very compelling case.、Um, for those of you not、uh, deeply familiar with the field, let's keep in mind hydrogen is not an energy source; it is an energy carrier. So the the real challenge is how it is that we can produce hydrogen in a sustainable manner. Nevertheless, here are some of the reasons why hydrogen is a promising future energy carrier.、Uh, the waste product of burning hydrogen is merely water vapor. It can reduce or eliminate pollution from fossil fuels. Again, I, I put reduce slash eliminate because it depends on how the hydrogen is produced. It's non-toxic, non-poisonous. It can eliminate our economic dependence on imported fuels. Uh, it can reduce air pollution. In many ways, it's safer than conventional、uh, than other fossil fuels. It can allow countries to become economically、um, independent of imported fuels. I mentioned that one. The other one is、uh, it can and I believe will become economically competitive with、uh, fossil fuels. Last but not least on this on this list anyway is the.、Um, I think is is one of, if not the most important, protecting the environment for future generations, our children and our grandchildren. Hydrogen is used in many forms already throughout the world. It's currently a, a worldwide market of around 200 billion dollars per year. It is growing rapidly at around 10 percent per year, and that's because it is a very important industrial gas. It's used in the、uh, Production of fertilizer、uh, in the ammonia production that goes into the production of our food. About half of the world's hydrogen goes to that source, and then another large source of hydrogen is used for the、um, upgrading of heavy oils, such as bitumen in Alberta. That requires an enormous amount of hydrogen to upgrade bitumen to synthetic crude oil. In terms of hydrogen as an energy carrier, there are a number of major、uh, advances that are being made around the world as a energy carrier. In the transportation sector, there are demonstration programs around the world using hydrogen as a fuel for trains.、Uh, for cars,、uh, most of the major automakers have、uh, significant developments in hydrogen vehicles, investing billions of dollars, and there are many. Uh, breakthroughs that are being made in hydrogen vehicles. Also,、uh, planes is just another example here where there are、um, uh, advances being made by companies such as Airbus and Boeing on studies that are using liquid hydrogen as the fuel. Now, hydrogen has a lower volumetric density than kerosene as a jet fuel. However, it has a much it has a, a higher gravimetric Density. So those two, in many ways, offset each other. So you're looking at just slightly larger tanks for hydrogen, but not enormously, outrageously larger. So these are some of the current uses for hydrogen.、Uh, a lot has been said about hydrogen versus electric vehicles. It,、um, I think there's a role for that both will have. The ultimate end game is still unknown. However, I would like to point out there is a lot to be said for chemical fuels. They have a higher energy density, and what this graph is showing is basically in the going from left to right, you have diesel, hydrogen, and electric batteries for a given range of up close to、um, 300 miles. Um, looking at the system and the fuel, you will see in the middle with the hydrogen in blue that both in terms of the volume、um, and the size of the system, that hydrogen is significantly smaller, both in terms of mass and volume. So, the point being is that I, at the end, I don't really know which one is.、Uh, 
is going to be the end game. It, I think there's a, a lot to be said of both being synergistic and complementary, but the point I'm trying to make is that there is um, chemical fuels, I believe, are here with us to stay. They have a lot of major advantages over batteries. Okay, so hydrogen, though, is in a way paradoxical, clean to use, but generally dirty to produce. And dirty, what I mean is that about 96% of the hydrogen in the world today is produced from fossil fuels. Through reformation of natural gas or coal or oil, you can strip the hydrogen molecules out. Steam methane reforming is the predominant current method of producing hydrogen. Electrolysis is, uh, uh, you, you may remember this from your high school uh, chemistry and physics, that you can use electricity to split water. That is a commercial technology, however, it's not um, nowhere near as efficient and the costs are much higher than steam methane reforming. It explains why it's pr generally used when very high purity of hydrogen is needed, like in food production, but generally not currently um, economically competitive against the, the, uh, the fossil-derived hydrogen methods. So the question is, are there any other uh, alternatives for clean hydrogen production? How can we produce hydrogen that is sustainable in a large capacity at a low cost that will be able to compete against fossil fuels? This is a, uh, a chart that I've taken from CEA France that pulled up the um, sustainable hydrogen production programs, major programs around the world. And the, the different colors represent electrolysis. The red is a sulfur iodine cycle, orange hybrid sulfur, and yellow copper chlorine cycle, which I'm going to talk about briefly. What I mean by clean hydrogen production is low or zero carbon hydrogen production. And this is really the, the end game or the end goal that that, uh, that uh, we should be striving towards. Okay, so in countries around the world, thermochemical cycles are under um, development, major active development. The lead, the two of the leading cycles are depicted here. Sulfur-based uh, sulfur cycles essentially are processes that split water into hydrogen and oxygen through a series of chemical processes that use compounds like sulfur on the left or copper chlorine on the right to split the water. And they basically need those compounds to help the water splitting. Because water splitting in itself is very difficult. It's a very stable molecule. And if you just want heat alone, you need temperatures of, of about 3,000 degrees to split the water molecule. So through the use of these intermediate compounds, the water splitting can occur. Sulfur iodine cycle in develop, active development at the stage of pilot plant level is a, a cycle that requires 900 degrees. A Canadian consortium that I'll be talking about is developing a very promising alternative, we believe, called the copper chlorine cycle because it can operate at temperatures much lower of 500 degrees. It can use waste heat from industrial waste heat sources um, reactions go to full completion and uh, quite a high efficiency of around 44% of heat to hydrogen. In other words, it eliminates the intermediate production of electricity by going directly from heat to hydrogen. So this is what I, will, I would like to talk about is our efforts um, on the copper chlorine cycle. Again, here is a very quick schematic that shows heat and water coming in from the left and a series of chemical processes that sequentially split water into hydrogen and oxygen. One of the reactors is, is uh, splitting the water into oxygen, producing an intermediate uh, product of molten cupric chloride, and one of the other reactors is splitting the hydrogen off the byproduct. The main thing that we need to know is that there are no external emissions to the environment, and all of the copper chlorine compounds are recirculated internally. This is not part of the presentation, by the way. <laughs> okay, cancel. Okay, so this is a demonstration, the world's first lab-scale 
demonstration of the copper chlorine cycle at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology in Oshawa together with our partners. It consists of the four processes that you see. Okay. Oh, just accept. Okay, can I get some IT help here? Presentation? Yeah. Yes. This one? No. Greg Natter. Well, this well I, think we've got, uh, I think we've got uh, um, a new buzzword here. Uh, thermo, thermo, let me think, what was it? Thermo, Thermochemical. Thermochemical hydrogen production. I'm going to try and stick that in my head because that's quite useful. Sorry for the interruption, everyone. Getting back to it here, I, I'm leading an international consortium on the world's first demonstration of an integrated copper chlorine cycle, a $10 million project that has a number of industry and university partners from Canada and abroad. Can be um, using either nuclear energy or any other source of heat, such as solar energy or an industrial waste heat. So um, we're the project started approximately six years ago and our aim is to develop this uh, first pilot plant in the world over uh, the coming years. So our process, we've gone through the small lab scale on the left that has been demonstrated by the Argonne National Lab in the US. We've uh, passed the second step which is the unit lab scale operations and we're working towards the third column, as you can see, towards uh, pilot scale reactors. And our ambition and goal is uh, hydrogen commercial plants that would produce hydrogen on the order of 500 to 800 tons per day. This would take millions of vehicles currently using gasoline off the road. Okay, except I'm really... This is the disadvantage of being last in the series of four presenters. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm really having a... I don't have a password. Okay. I will have to go very quickly now so it doesn't happen. The, um, another project, solar hydrogen production, um, is, is another project that we're working on with a, with a Toronto-based company. Um, economic impact of hydrogen. I talked to you about the enormous potential uh, benefit not only as an energy carrier, but the graph on the right is showing the, the extreme rapid rise in the need for hydrogen in the industrial sector alone, never mind the use of it as becoming a, a future transportation fuel. <clears throat> okay, one, a few other points uh, is hydrogen can be used as an energy storage medium. We heard about solar and wind earlier. One of the uh, absolutely extremely promising technologies we all know for the future. One of the challenges though is the storage and uh, consistent output. What do we do when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing? Hydrogen can serve as a energy storage medium in order to smooth out the peaks and valleys by using excess electricity to produce hydrogen and then when um, the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing, converting that hydrogen back to electricity through fuel cells. Definitely uh, another very important role for hydrogen. Um, distribution, uh, there are about 50 million tons per year of hydrogen that are produced and transported. So a lot of people talk, you know, well, what about the difficulty with hydrogen transportation and distribution? It's a non-issue in the sense of the technology. There's 50 million tons that are being used and transported on an annual basis. So industry very well has this problem in hand, either through pipelines or through canisters or liquid hydrogen through, through trucks or by ship it can be transported. Okay, so um, I would just like to now show you one possible vision of the future that I think is a, is a um, important potential end game, which is solar hydrogen, nuclear hydrogen as another combination to produce the fuel that we need for the industry, as well as a, a transport fuel, um, distributed power, and this is one I think um, vision of the future 20 to 30 years from now that will have increasingly uh, increasing importance. So um, I just have two slides left here and I'd just like to talk about what the 
global hydrogen scenario would look like, how much would it cost, and what are the practicalities? Uh, within, the next, um, within the next two to three decades, studies have shown anywhere between 30 to 70 percent penetration of hydrogen vehicles. That would offset effectively 7 to 16 million barrels of oil per day. And that is, by the way, using fossil-derived hydrogen. If we, can use, if we can develop large-scale technologies of not low or non-carbon hydrogen, those, uh, that, that reduction would even be, even be greater. Hydrogen infrastructure on the order of one to two trillion dollars. Um, sounds like a lot, but when you consider over the next few decades, 20 trillion dollars will be spent on the energy infrastructure, including around four and three trillion respectively, then one trillion as a relative percentage doesn't seem as insurmountable, especially if you consider the reduction in that energy infrastructure that will occur to the extent by which hydrogen will be used to replace fossil fuel vehicles on the road. So, and just lastly speaking here at the end, how much uh, CO2 reduction could be achieved? I think um, major reductions depending on the source of hydrogen, but if we have fossil hydrogen carbon capture storage, basically 80% reduction in the CO2 emissions. I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and acknowledge all of the funding sponsors for this research. Thanks again. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Clearly, hydrogen is not a lot of hot air. Well done. Um, now we're going to uh, we're going to explore the wider context of uh, raised by the presentations, as well as the challenges we face in moving towards a system that is. Uh, much more increasingly electrified, but also sustainably so. Um, Jay, uh, is the challenge then um, to remove that spikiness from when it comes to re renewables? Like uh, you mentioned briefly hydro, where that doesn't become an issue except in long-term long cycles. But removing that spikiness from wind and solar, that's the challenge, isn't it? And there isn't, there's nothing that really can plug into that. You've got to have your base load. Well, it's one of three challenges. You certainly have to have that as a necessary but not sufficient condition. The other two challenges are the land use and the price or cost, uh, which in a competitive environment will become the same. But at the moment, uh, wind is nearly competitive, uh, although the subsidy in the U.S. is currently at 2 percent wind, uh, just around $2 billion a year for the production tax credit. At 10 times that, that's the size of, let's say, the NASA budget, so it may not be sustainable. So we have three challenges, the variability, the cost, and the land use. I think all three of those are surmountable at of the order of 15, 20, 25 percent, uh, but they won't be surmountable if you want to go 100 percent. So uh, it's not just land use, though, it's also the construction. A lot of people think that uh, wind and solar are very passive, but it's actually the, uh, the cost of making solar panels, for example. If you factor that in, in the life cycle, the carbon life cycle, uh, there's a cost there too. They don't look, they're not totally, um, you know, they're not totally as passive as they seem. The, the uh, life cycle uh, for even cadmium telluride solar panels is fairly low percentage of the total CO2 reduction. But it's not a small percentage of the total cost. And let's remember, the total cost of a solar power system is only half the solar panels. I could give you the solar panels for free today, and the balance of system costs would still be of the order of $2,000 a kilowatt. And with a 20% capacity factor, that's equivalent to $8,000 a kilowatt for, let's say, geothermal power or nuclear. You can see, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> energy is not going to be an easy, uh, an easy thing to solve. This is why it's taken so long. And uh, this is why we're taking at least three days to go through some of these fabulous ideas. Um, Yasin, uh, it sounds just too good to be true, doesn't it? You burn old nuclear waste, you get it, or at least you uh, get extract power from that nuclear waste. You create a waste that's uh, uniformly, what, a thousand uh, years um, uh, will be um, a thousand year life cycle. Uh, life, um, Time and then you uh, you also can't make it go hypercritical. It won't. You ever, it don't have a meltdown. It just it just sounds too good to be true. And is that part of the reason that we haven't seen one developed to date? 
No, unfortunately, uh, there are still some R&D uh, issues, technological issues, which have to be uh, uh, solved uh, before we see a major uh, implementation or deployment of this kind of system, at least in the hundreds of megawatts or gigawatt scale. Uh, these are mostly related to accelerator technology. Uh, we do have uh, very energetic accelerators. I think the LHC is one example. Uh, what we do need here is very powerful uh, uh, accelerators, so that's energy times intensity current. And uh, we are quite limited today, so we are talking about uh, megawatt uh, scale uh, uh, accelerators where we would need uh, tens of megawatts, so we're still maybe an order of magnitude below. But this is not uh, insurmountable, I think this is uh, current uh, uh, research, uh, R&D is going on to, to develop these kind of systems in the context of uh, uh, spallation neutron sources or uh, these kind of things. I think uh, we have a perfect example in, uh, in Oak Ridge uh, of a multi-megawatt accelerator uh, uh, in, uh, in operation in Jay Park as well. Uh, which has been uh, damaged by the uh, earthquake, but uh, will be back in operation quite soon, I believe. And we are currently de designing a 5 to 10 megawatt uh, uh, accelerator in Europe, in, uh, in Lund, in Sweden, in the context of the European Spallation uh, Nutrition Source. The second uh, most challenging uh, uh, um, aspect from the technological point of view is the coupling between the accelerator and the reactor. This goes through uh, what we call a spallation neutron source. So this is where the protons, accelerated particles, are converted to neutrons. Neutrons are the particles which induce uh, fissions. And uh, for the moment, again, uh, a successful test and operation of this kind of spallation targets have taken place in uh, Switzerland at the megawatt level where we need uh, uh, systems uh, similar to this operating at an order of magnitude below. So I think this is uh, uh, um, the main technological issues related to the uh, uh, development of these kind of systems. The rest is just uh, uh, running an accelerator. We've been doing this for the last uh, uh, 30 or 40 years. Running uh, reactors, we know how to do that. So it's just coupling both technologies, which still needs a bit of R&D, but I think that's... And it makes uh, you look at... Uh, nuclear waste as a, a source of energy, fuel, rather than, uh, than something you have to worry about. Absolutely. I think uh, the, the main advantage is... Uh, uh, and, you, you know, this, uh, from this point of view, I think whether you want to uh, uh, increase nuclear capacity or phase out from, from nuclear power, as in the case of Germany, uh, I think in the next uh, 10 years or 20 years, uh, nuclear waste will still remain an issue and you will have to deal with it. And the best way to uh, destroy nuclear waste is to uh, fission it. So somehow you will have to uh, use this kind of system. And you think that's a solution. Craig, you're an energy superhero. I love that line. Uh, what, uh, is it really, that, so the impediment here is drilling technology, but it's also investment, it seems to be. Cause, or, or are you saying that the drilling side of things, you're saying that in Russia they ha they've only uh, gone 12 kilometers, that's a third of the way. What, is it a drilling thing and the financing, or is it just one? Uh, it's actually both. It's the combination, um, especially if you're speaking to a community that is in the finance side, doesn't necessarily mean they have the, the technical knowledge to understand exactly what you're doing. So it takes a, a certain character, I think, in terms of the project development to be able to bridge the gap between the science and the actual finance. And I think a lot of projects, and not just geothermal, struggle with this idea that you have a great idea, it's in your garage or it's in, you know, in the lab, to be able to take it to a point where you can actually market it and sell it and be able to raise the necessary financing. Um, geothermal projects are you know, anywhere between three and six million dollars a megawatt installed. So even a small 10 megawatt facility is, is upwards of 50 million dollars. This is not a small ask. And if you're in a position where you have done all the geologic research you can prior to outright drilling, that might not be enough to give the financier the comfort to know that this isn't a high risk project. But as you said, all of that financing goes up front, all that investment is front-loaded. Right, especially before you've actually drilled the first well, and that first well may be able to tell you what you need to know in order to drill the next one, and the next one. And every time you drill, you actually get better, you know more about your subsurface environment. Hmm. The disadvantage is if I've never drilled one and I have a great idea, I'm never going to get the money to drill the first one. So maybe the analogy is more uh, building a set of apartments and then running, living off the rent. You've got the initial expenditure up front, but then over time you, 
you uh, extract money out of the apartments. There's been different sort of business models to approach this, whether I try and build a 50 megawatt plant, which may be the most efficient system to approach, it may actually make more sense to drill a 5 megawatt program just so that I have enough information to be able to take it to the next level to do the next 5 and then the next 10, gain that subsurface knowledge so that I can ease the minds of the financiers to say, okay, you didn't dump in 500 million, you only put in 20, and then I can get the process rolling. Well, Greg, you were talking about uh, in Florida at the beginning where uh, you know, a whole bunch of apartments or skyscrapers were being built. Maybe that's where you should get the financing from because they don't seem to worry, or to worry about risk. Um, Greg, that's a very different way of, of looking at uh, of hydrogen. It's, it's fascinating. and You can cut it in many different ways. Pardon me? It's a very different way of looking at hydrogen because the traditional way that people would probably be familiar with it is putting it in your tank, but you're talking about it as part of a whole ecosystem. In terms of an infrastructure, yes, yeah. hydrogen can be used to, to heat our homes. Um, it can be used to supply fuel for vehicles. Uh, there, there is an infrastructure out there uh, for natural gas, for example, that, that, we, um, that we all know about. And in fact, one could add hydrogen to natural gas pipelines up to approximately 15 to 20 percent content and in a way start to decarbonize natural gas and, and reduce the, green, the, the CO2 emissions from that. So there is, there is that infrastructure. If one wants to transport hydrogen 100% in pipelines, then it would need to be a different form other than what they're using for natural gas. It would have to be some uh, metal, metal pipes as opposed to plastic. But um, that, part, that part is doable from a technological perspective. In terms of the... Uh, the, the storage of hydrogen, this is often pointed to by uh, um, people about the challenges that, that hydrogen storage would have in vehicles. Uh, the, the, the automakers are making major advances. So one could uh, compress hydrogen to 700 bars or higher. Um, uh, storage in metal hydrides is, a, is another potential option that is providing a, you know, a type of range for hydrogen vehicles that we currently see with our current vehicles that we're driving. So that, that's, that's the, um, the storage side of it. And then the next part, of course, is the production, which is what I was talking about. And really, to be able to make the major impact on the greenhouse gas uh, reduction, we need to look at producing hydrogen at a large capacity, at a low cost. And that's, again, where I think our team, amongst others, are making some major advances in those areas. Okay. We're going to switch now uh, to questions. We're going to firstly hear from our summit participants, and uh, if we get some time, we'll go to the audience. Now, we have the first question. Please go ahead. Uh, please identify yourself and the country you're from. Hi, um, my name is Gita. I'm from Indonesia. It's specifically on geothermal, actually, the question. Well, um, it has been estimated that Indonesia ha now have around 40% of the known potential of geothermal, but then again, we only utilize about 1% out of it. But the thing is, it's not because of the funding. We sort of move forward uh, past that because the government just issued a whole new pricing structure. But the thing is, on the other hand, we need to um, distribute the electricity to, we have less than 60% uh, of people with uh, electricity system. Um, so I'm just wondering what would be, um, you think the alternative to do that and maintain the actual goal of uh, keeping it sustainable, affordable, and accessible, basically. Thank you. Yeah, that's quite the list. Uh, affordable, sustainable, and accessible. Uh, the UN actually suggests that remote electrification is actually one of the fastest ways to bring communities out of poverty. So I think the idea that we don't do a 100 megawatt or 200 megawatt power facility, we look at that model again and say, maybe we can actually do a smaller, um, maybe less efficient, but in terms of the actual power program, so, you know, 10 or 5 megawatt projects in some of those communities are closer to them so that we don't have this issue of running, you know, hundreds of lines of, of transmission. It does require a different sort of mindset and it does require an different exploration and finance project. So it, it requires you to take the original model of this is how you do geothermal and turn it on its head. But it is, it is viable. Anyone else have a comment? No, we're back to... Uh Who's taking, yeah, someone here. I have a question for Yassine on the nuclear power issue. My name is Aaron Leopold. I'm from the United States. Um, basically, you said there are still R&D challenges. Um, if you look at the solar industry, there were, and there are still R&D challenges, but it's something that industry has gotten behind in a very fast manner. It's 
exponentially grown, exponentially faster than was expected and whatnot. And given the economic safety and other benefits that this technology has, I'm curious to know about industry interest and if there isn't industry interest, why that might be. Because it's, especially this current time, it seems like there should be a great search for new nuclear solutions, considering although countries are giving it up, many are refusing to do so. Okay, so I think you pointed to one of the main uh, issues regarding the development of uh, this technology is that uh, I would say it's not in the direct interest of the nuclear industry to develop this technology quite fast. Nuclear industry is quite shy, you know, uh, every time you change a bolt, a nut in a design in a nuclear reactor it will take about five to ten years to have it licensed. So they don't want to, do, they want to, to make, to, you have to evolve the system I think from the safety point of view, that goes in deploying uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, safety systems. You never change the basic design of the reactor, you change uh, uh, the safety around the reactor. So that's how industry is used to evolve. Here we're talking about a revolution in terms of operating and designing these systems. And I think industry is quite shy towards this. Uh, remember, they want to sell these machines. Uh, cost is not really an issue, I think by if you really did the cost analysis of these systems, you would figure out that they're not that expensive with respect to current technology. Just have to see a PWR today of the third generation costs about two or three times what it used to cost in the past, the first, second generation uh, reactors, because we developed uh, or we enhanced the, the safety issues. That's the price to pay. So cost is not an issue. It's just the fact that it would take uh, uh, some time to have it uh, licensed uh, uh, properly and industry is not uh, willing to do so. But this, they will have to change, of course. Jay, you have a comment. Uh, let me just make a point on the premise of your question. The solar industry has actually not put a great deal of money into R&D because they have these rich deployment incentives. If we were to do serious R&D, on different ways of converting sunlight into electric power or end use, that would be a very nice thing. We haven't done so. The biggest advance has been cadmium telluride, which knocked about 25% uh, off the uh, cost of solar cells. That's not what's needed. There's an order of magnitude almost needed. Okay, we're gonna take uh, last question here from the floor. Hello, my, hello, my name is Jacob, uh, I'm from Denmark, and my question is for Jay Apt. Um, we're all here to speak about uh, what's transformational about energy technologies. So I'm wondering, you spoke a great deal about what the challenges are and how we might overcome these with wind and solar power. But what is transformational about wind and solar? How does it, and, and let me prompt you a little bit, is it that it'll change the way we think about energy? Will it lead us down a soft energy path with distributed generation. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, anytime you change something by an order of magnitude, it is transformational. I think there probably is an order of magnitude uh, available in wind in the U.S. going from 1.8% to 20-ish percent. Uh, solar is very interesting. We've had uh, a large social movement for distributed solar that started in the mid-1950s and then res uh, had a resurgence in the early 1970s that was all about a social transformation, going away from central station generation to distributed solar. We just don't have the economics uh, to do that, and I don't actually see economics for distributed solar electricity happening. Where there is a great unmet solar opportunity is solar water heating. That's used extensively throughout much of the world, but not in a large uh, portion of the developed world. So transformational, yes. Really very different from what we have now, probably uh, in certain respects. But let's remember, there's no silver bullet. And each of these technologies has feet of clay. But just because there's no free lunch doesn't mean we can't eat. Well, that's a, a fantastic, fantastic way to finish up. I'm sorry, sir, we're not going to be able to take uh, your question. We're running out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the close of the session, and uh, I'm, I'd like to, act, uh, to thank Jay Apt, Yasin Kadi, Greg Dunn, and Greg Naitara.
And I asked some of the participants, Our summit participants will soon adjourn to actually do the hard work of bringing some of these ideas to reality. Uh, for those of you online, the next public lecture takes place uh, this afternoon, later today. The speaker will be Vaslav Shmiel, a distinguished professor uh, at the University of Manitoba and the author of 30 books. Uh, his talk is entitled Energy Transitions. Uh, you can uh, find out more at wgsi.org. Uh, thank you everyone for taking part, and I'll see you again tomorrow.